Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the immovable hope that we have that remains for us in Christ. Thank you for your son, Jesus, and the way that he has provided a way where there was no way. Thank you for the life that we have in him, that we can live for the glory of your name. Lord, we pray that as we come to your word now this morning, that you would give us humble hearts eager to receive your word, eager to be doers of the word, that we might glorify you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, please turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 4 through 14. Philippians chapter 4. A story is told of John Horace Buford by his daughter. Buford was drafted to Fort Jackson, South Carolina in 1943, where he began his career with the U.S. Army as a paratrooper with the 506th Infantry. From there, he was assigned to the 101st Airborne Division for a short time, but for personal family reasons, he transferred to the 663rd Tank Destroyer Battalion at Fort Hood, Texas. The 663rd was disbanded, and John was reassigned to the 86th Black Hawk Infantry Division, known as Company H, for heavy weapons. Buford's unit was deployed to San Luis Obispo, California, for assignment to General Patton's Ghost Army. However, the MPs loaded John on the wrong train and sent him to Newark, New Jersey, where he ended up on a ship headed to France. When he discovered that he was on the wrong ship with the wrong unit, he asked the sergeant, what do you want me to do? I can swim back if you want. The sergeant asked him what was his assigned MOS when he responded that he was a tank driver. The sergeant replied, well, guess what, son? I have a tank waiting for you with your name on it. Well, John's ship landed in Normandy, France on June 6, 1944 at Utah Beach. He climbed down a rope ladder off the side of the ship and onto a landing ship tank known as the LST. He drove a tank off the LST onto the shore up to the hillside of Utah Beach with literally zero visibility. His unit fought their way across France. He rejoined his assigned unit around January of 1945, and Buford assumed his duties with the 86th Black Hawk Division, Company H, as a 50 caliber machine gunner on the back of a Jeep under General Patton. Under his command, the 86th Black Hawks moved out of France. Buford's unit captured the Axis Minister of Hungary, Hungary and recovered the stolen crown of St. Stephen. They spearheaded General Patton's third army for the Bavarian push across the Danube River into Austria and overtook Hitler's home, known as the Eagle's Nest. After Germany and a short, short furlough back in the United States, John's unit was deployed to Japan where they were aboard a ship sitting in the harbor waiting for their command to move in and invade Japan, when the first atomic bomb was dropped in Hiroshima and the second at Nagasaki, John's ship was then turned around and sent to the Philippine Islands to secure the Japanese that were in hiding. He stayed in the Philippines until the end of the war. In 2014, John Buford had the opportunity to travel to Normandy and attend the 70th anniversary of D-Day. There he revisited the banks of Utah Beach upon his return to Normandy some 70 years after D-Day, and this is what John had to say. He said, when I stood at the top of Utah Beach where I had landed 70 years ago, my heart was heavy and tears filled my eyes as I thought of all my friends and brethren that never made it past the beach. I've carried a burden in my heart all these years for the soldiers I ignored that were lying on that beach, wounded and begging for help. But I try to always remember that I was assigned that mission. And my responsibility was to successfully complete that mission, no matter what the cost. He goes on to say, just 
like in life. God gives each one of us a mission, and no matter the cost, we must live our lives fully for him, striving to fulfill his command. He spared my life on that beach so that I may share these stories and my faith with others. For that, I am grateful and owe it all to his glory. Buford accidentally got on the wrong ship and was given a mission, and he understood what his responsibility was. And he continually pressed on time after time, neglecting even honorable things to make sure he stood firm in his responsibilities and followed the instruction he received. Each one of us has been thrown quite the curveball in light of the circumstances we face in the midst of COVID-19. And yet, despite these unusual times with unusual circumstances, no matter the cost, we must live our lives fully for God, striving to fulfill his commands for us, his commands to us. And this morning, we're going to look at a text that will help us to do this. So let's look at Philippians 4, verses 4 through 14. Philippians 4, starting in verse 4. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Verse eight, finally, Brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Verse 10 But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. If any and every cir- in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. The aim of every believer, the aim of every believer is to be the glory of God. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, his ambition is to be pleasing to the Lord in all things. That is to be the heartbeat for every believer that the core of who we are would be about honoring God. And God in his sovereign goodness actually uses trials, uses struggles, uses hardships to bring to the surface what is in us. We know that God uses all things for our good and his glory and for those who are his. One of the sweetest goods that God uses trials for is to show the reality and really pull back the curtain to our hearts. He brings to the surface both the purities of our faith and the impurities where we believe and where we doubt, where we stand firm and where we falter. And this can be a painful process. No one denies that. In fact, God's promise for believers isn't a life of ease and worldly comfort. In fact, difficulty is to be expected for the believer, but he does promise comfort for your soul and strength to persevere, strength to press on, to not shrink away when our faith is put to the test, but to stand firm. And this is greater than any physical comfort one could experience in this life. In fact, in verse one of chapter four, Paul actually calls the believers in Philippi to stand firm. Look at verse one for just a moment. Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown in this way, stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. Paul 
Paul then gives instruction for how to help two women resolve conflict within the church. And then in verse four, we see these commands start to flow. And this is what we're going to be looking and narrowing in our focus at this morning. There's a lot of uncertainty right now. COVID-19 has really thrown everyone's plans for a loop. Graduation plans, school plans, trips, family trips, work trips, just simply how we shop, how we buy things, financial implications, weddings are being adjusted or postponed, funerals and memorial services are being changed. People are anxious, disappointed, disheartened, angry, uncertain. And all of us at some point have probably experienced or felt this way. And yet the call for the believer is to stand firm. Well, how do we get there? We must get there, but, but how? What would it look like to stand firm in the Lord right now? How, what would it look like to stand firm in the Lord for the Lord in the midst of what we are facing this very day? Well, in our passage this morning, we're gonna see six directives that aid us in standing firm. Six directives that aid us in standing firm. And really, these are six directives for standing firm in tumultuous times. Six directives for standing firm in tumultuous times, in difficult times. Six instructions that will aid us, will fortify us in standing firm when things are hard, when things are uncertain, when things are difficult. That's what we're going to look at this morning. Stand firm in tumultuous times. So six directives for standing firm in tumultuous times. The first one is this, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. That's the first directive for standing firm. Look at verse four again. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Rejoice. This is to be in a state of happiness. It's to be delighted, to be glad. And this is a command to rejoice comprehensively, always. And there's no nuance in the word or the context that lets us off the hook here. Always does mean always. Every believer, every believer is to rejoice in the Lord always. And if that wasn't jarring enough, he says it again, rejoice you might think, Josh, that, that might be easy for some, but I, I'm a realist here. The command is nevertheless the same. It is to rejoice. But there's a crucial point in this command to note. He isn't saying rejoice because of our circumstances. He's saying rejoice, find reasons to rejoice in the Lord. What does this mean to rejoice in the Lord? The right thoughts of God should bring us to a sense of delight. You are to reflect on the realities of who the Lord is, on what he is like, on what he has done in any and every circumstance. You bring your mind to the Lord, reflecting on him and rejoice in him. Let me say for a moment what this doesn't mean. This doesn't mean there isn't appropriate sorrow. Or that we are insensitive or don't empathize or care for others in trials with hurts. This doesn't mean we ignore reality or, or put our head in the sand. We don't ignore reality of the moment or the difficulties that we find ourselves in. But it does mean we anchor our soul to the Lord. And when thinking rightly about the Lord, there is always something to rejoice in. In the midst of conflict, persecutions of the world, threats of imminent death, all of these Paul himself was facing. And the Christian is to maintain a heart level disposition of joy and rejoicing in the Lord. How do you do this? Well, the thoughts of God should bring us to a sense of gladness. Even in our sorrows, we can rejoice. Even in our mourning, we can joyfully worship God. We can say, blessed is the name of the Lord. And we can rejoice in him. 
There's just no circumstance, no trial, no hardship, no difficulty bigger than God. And the believer is to count the will of God, their greatest joy, to walk in. And so while the world may be known by grumbling, disputing, the believer, as Paul says in chapter 2, is to do neither of those things. Rather, the world grumbles and the believer rejoices. The world complains. The believer is glad. The world argues and raises their fist to God. The believer humbly trusts and delights in the Lord. Paul wrote this from prison. He's already mentioned in chapter one, he knows there is a very good chance he might die. Why could he give this kind of instruction? Why can believers be glad and rejoice no matter what the circumstances? Because we can rejoice in the Lord. There are very real struggles right now among us in our church, in our lives Financial uncertainty, uncertainty with employment, sickness, sickness of loved ones, being denied access to loved ones as they are in their final moments on this world, loneliness, heartache, sorrows, and yet you can't, we can't let our circumstances around us dictate our emotional state. And in the Lord, there is always reason to rejoice. There is always reason to be glad in him. Where are you looking for emotional stability right now? You find yourself thinking, I, I, when will this all be over? There's unrest in my heart. And if, if there was clarity in my employment, if there was clarity in my finances, if there was clarity in my relationships, if there was clarity in my pantries and what I have stocked, oh, when is this all over? That would be helpful for me. We don't have to look at those things for emotional stability. We can always find something to rejoice in, to be glad in, to stay our hearts upon in the Lord. The first directive for standing firm in tumultuous times is to rejoice always, rejoice always. The second directive for standing firm in tumultuous times is let your gentleness be known to all. Let your gentleness be known to all. Look at verse five. Paul says, let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. The word for gentle spirit in the Greek is a little tricky to capture in English. It's a, a sweet gentleness and charity toward others. It's a, a contented, humble disposition. You're content and humble. There's a sense of responding to the faults of others with graciousness of humility. It produces patience to endure injustice, mistreatment without retaliation or bitterness or vengeance. You're willing to yield your personal rights in any and every moment to show consideration and gentleness to others. Gentleness, gentle spirit. Are you content? In the moments that the Lord has you in this day, are you content? If you are practicing this, you don't, you don't lash out. You're not on edge. You're not a rebel rouser. You're not just looking for a good debate. You don't take it upon yourself to put everyone in your path in their place. There is a humility, a graciousness about you. And this disposition, this, this dominant characteristic is to be known by all men about you. All those who come in your path should know this about you. It should so come out of your life that when you interact with others, this thought comes to mind about you. What are you known for? When people sum you up, does the thought of humility, gentleness, meekness, graciousness, willingness to endure mistreatment with a contentedness about you come up at all? How about your presence on social media? 
At times, many of us feel a, a sense and need to fight and argue and confront people we don't even know on platforms that make this principle especially hard. It's hard to hear someone's heart or tone in written form. This makes it that much more important for us to be careful with what and how and when we respond, if we respond, or pick those battles. What, what are you known for? How, how much time and thought do you spend defending the truth to people you don't know versus faithfully living the truth with a spirit of gentleness with the people in your immediate proximity? Misplaced priorities are dangerous to be so vocal about the truth, fighting theological battles online, and yet to be contentious in our homes is unacceptable, unpleasing to the Lord. Is your gentle spirit known to your children? Is your contented, humble disposition felt by your wife? by your husband, by your friends, by your neighbors, by your coworkers. Paul gives us an incredible aid for doing this. He follows up this instruction with this statement, the Lord is near. We can demonstrate a contented spirit because we are influenced by the Lord's nearness. There is now, some debate on this, and, and what is Paul talking about in the near, nearness here? Is, is he talking about Jesus' return or the nearness of the Lord to the Christian? Both realities are true within Scripture, but what I believe Paul has in mind here is the latter, that the presence of the Lord is near to his children, and this reality is to create a disposition of humble, humbleness and forbearance and gentleness because we know God's presence in our midst with us. We don't have to respond harshly, controlling things that are hard or, or that we want differently because we know God is near and that he'll never leave us or forsake us in the midst of these things, that this is the nearness of the Lord. Have you ever had one of your children experience night terrors? In the middle of the night, they start screaming and you go to tend to them and they, they sit up and you might be able to even hold them for a moment, but they're still screaming. Their eyes are wide open with fear and terror. All you wanna do in that moment is for them to know that you are near them. Their entire disposition would change if they snapped out of it and knew your presence, knew your nearness. Their fears would vanish. Their concerns would go away. Their terror would dissipate into gladness and comfort if they knew the safety that they were in, in your arms. When we remember the Lord is near to us, we can have a contented, humble, gentle disposition in every circumstance with all who come across our path because we know that our loving Lord is near to us. He loves us. He tends to us. The question we must ask is, do you find yourself more concerned about your situation or more confident in the nearness of the Lord? Rejoice in the Lord. Let your gentleness be known to all. Next, number three, how do we stand firm in tumultuous times? Be anxious for nothing. And number three and number four really go together. They're paired up together very helpfully for us. But look at verse six, be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about anything. Sounds so simple to say and, and even heartless to say, don't be anxious. Yet to help someone stop worrying, to help someone repent of anxiety is one of the most loving things that we can do. Anxiety is anything but harmless. It impacts not only the spiritual well-being of an individual, but it impacts us physically. Loss of sleep, ulcers, headaches, back pain, neck pain, digestion issues, and many, many other things that, that impact us physically. 
And yet we should be much more concerned about what anxiety does spiritually to an individual, the offense that it is against the Lord. And in this command, we see that, that none of us are a victim of anxiety. Anxiety doesn't happen to us. Anxiety comes from within us. It's something we do. We worry, we're anxious. And the command here is to be anxious for nothing. Don't allow any circumstance to lead you to anxiety. Be anxious about nothing. Refuse to be anxious. Don't be okay with being anxious. Don't blame shift for anxiety. The instruction here is be anxious for nothing. And it makes sense this instruction would follow the call to rejoice always. Anxiety robs your joy. It taints your testimony. It consumes your mind. It reveals where your faith is lacking. And Jesus knew the propensity for man to worry about his life, about things that you eat and, and drink and wear. And Jesus instructs us also specifically, do not worry about these things. All of the necessities of life, our heavenly father knows we need those things. He, as our heavenly father, will give us everything we need and what we see is that worry is a symptom of wrong thinking. And all of us are capable in a moment of falling into wrong thinking and anxiousness. And God in his kindness does not leave us to the instruction without giving us a very helpful aid to obedience to this instruction. And that leads to our next number four aid. And that's to pray with thankfulness. Pray with thankfulness. Number four. Pick back up in verse six. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Verse seven, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What a promise. What a promise. The peace of God, the peace of God will guard us will guard our hearts and our minds. We don't have to be enslaved to anxiety. We don't have to be anxious, but in contrast to giving into wrong thinking, anxious thinking, in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Your greatest aid to curing anxiety is not a change of circumstances. It's not a break from the hardship of the moment. It's not a larger bank account. It's not a pill. It's prayer. Prayer. Again, we see the comprehensive word, everything. Those things you are being anxious over, all of them, take them to God in prayer and supplication. And remember verse five, he is near and he has instructed you to bring these things to him. Everything that worries you, bring it to God in prayer. You never have to fear God not wanting to hear from you. There's no anxiety that is too trite for God. No irrational fear that he will shame you over. Every moment of anxiety, listen, every moment of anxiety is irrational. When we consider the fact that we are God's child and he loves us and he is sovereign and he is good and he is wise and he is righteous and he is omnipotent, every moment of worry is in reality, when we're thinking rightly, utterly ridiculous. Why would we worry about anything when being a child of God? We don't have to weigh out if our anxiety is reasonable. It's all unreasonable which just magnifies the graciousness and kindness and love of God all the more that we can come to him with confidence that he, will, that he will hear us, that he will give us aid, he will care for us, he will grant to us as we come to him and present our requests to him with thanksgiving, he will give to us a peace that transcends all understanding. I've seen Facebook posts recently asking for those to share something good that has come from being home more. 
because of COVID-19. And I thought, these are so helpful. It's, it's far more natural. It's far easier to think on what we're lacking or missing out on or disgruntled by. And yet it's way more beneficial to think about what we are thankful for. And listen, being a prayer warrior is different than being a well-wisher. I think oftentimes we confuse the two, wishing things were different or wishing something different or wishing somebody well is not prayer. We need to carve out specific time each day to bring those cares that we have, to bring those anxieties, to cast them to the Lord, undistracted time where we can write out the things that we're thankful for in the midst of our circumstances. We can share those things with God, declare those things, pray pray and thank God for those things. God, thank you for what you have brought into my life. Thank you for who you are in the midst of this. And then we present our requests to God. We run to God in prayer with every worry, every concern, every uncertainty, every disappointment that causes heartache. He is near and he longs for you to bring your burdens, to cast your anxieties upon him. He cares for you. And there's hope that he has a supernatural peace that transcends understanding. Look again at verse seven. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Have you seen over the last seven years, our dear friends, the Hantless, response to trial? Wave of difficulty over and over again. And over and over again, thankfulness, peace, joy, a gentle contentment, in their heartache, in their sorrows, in their difficulties. And you watch that and you go, I could never do that. They're in a different category of Christian. I could never be that way. Their peace that they have isn't something they conjured up within themselves. They'd be the first to declare that. It is a gift of God that he gives to his children who faithfully present their requests to him with thankfulness a supernatural peace that God loves to give to those who are his and it guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. There is always something to worry about. And if we leave our minds unchecked, we will be undone. COVID-19 has brought a lot into our lives that is occasion to worry. This is hard. It can be hard, it can feel crippling, it can feel hopeless. There is hope. There's hope. And listen, if you're struggling with worry, if you are struggling with anxiety, please, if you are struggling with these things and you feel like, I don't know how to get out of this, reach out to your small group leader, reach out to any of the elders. We would love, love to walk with you to help you press forward with joy, with a contented disposition, and to really find the peace that is there for God's children. Number one, rejoice in the Lord. Two, let your gentleness be known to all. Number three, be anxious for nothing. Four, pray with thankfulness. Number five, dwell on the right things. Dwell on the right things. Verse eight, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The command is at the end of this verse. If you look again, verse eight, where he says, dwell on these things, that's the command. Don't worry, present your requests with thankfulness to God and dwell on these things. Anxiety flows from not thinking either rightly about things or not about the right things. And here we are called to dwell on the right things. Again, you're to control your mind. You're to set your mind on. And then we have a list here and we'll work work through these quickly. He says, whatever is true, the greatest truth we possess is God's word. 
And if you're setting your mind on scripture, you won't go wrong. But also there's a very practical reality that even in worldly things, set your mind on what is real, on what is true, on what is actual. Don't set your mind on conspiracy theories, on Facebook declarations, not on rumors or gossip. We need to give careful attention and thought to our our sources and, and what weight we give in our thought life to the various things we read in the news and so on. What do you dwell on? Another area we frequently violate dwelling on what is true is when we dwell on what could be or what might happen. Don't dwell on those things. Dwell on what is true. Next, Paul says, whatever is honorable, that is what is worthy of respect, what is dignified, things that are weighty or of value or worthy before the Lord, not trivial things, not shameful things. He says, whatever is right, this is what is just or righteous. Think about what is in accordance with God's standard. Don't dwell on what the world values, but what God values and says is good. And then he says, whatever is pure. Think on what is morally clean, undefiled, holy, what is lovely. We are home much more right now. Don't let your guard down on impure thinking as an escape or release from your worries. Be pure. Set your mind on what is pure. What is of good repute? This is what is praiseworthy or well-spoken of or highly regarded. And then he says, if there's any excellence in anything praiseworthy, which we know there are, This is that which is the best things, things that are to be commended. We shouldn't settle in our thinking. We should go for what is best and what is worthy of praise. Dwell on these things. At any moment in time, you should be able to stop yourself and ponder, what am I dwelling on? And ask, would God commend me on this? This is heart shepherding. This is why heart shepherding is so important. This is why we read our Bibles carefully and intentionally and purposefully. Don't be content to squeeze your Bible intake into the crevices of your life. How much better will you be able to do this? How how much better will you be able to stand firm in the midst of tumultuous circumstances? How much better will you be able to dwell on these things if you know God's word and have spent time in God's word? Recently, what we know and believe and dwell on influences what we think, which impacts how we feel, which impacts our ability to stand firm in the midst of tumultuous times and circumstances. Lastly, our last point comes in the form of example, not command. Paul says, the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And then he goes on to talk about what he has learned. And what we see lastly here is to learn contentment through Christ. We are to learn contentment through Christ. Look at verse 9. The things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Again, we see We see the nearness of God, that he will be with you, the fact that he brings peace into the lives of those who are his. And then verse 10, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. He is practicing the principle of rejoicing in all things. And he says, why he rejoiced? That now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Verse 11, not that I speak from one, for I have learned He learned to be content. This isn't something that just flows out of us naturally. We must learn this. We must grow in this. He says, to be content in whatever circumstance I am. Verse 12, I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. And then the lesson he learned, verse 13, I can do all things through him, who strengthens me, we learn contentment through Christ. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. Paul learned the secret to being content. He can rejoice in trial. He can have contented humility. He can avoid anxiety. He can be thankful. He can set his mind on the right things that are pleasing to the Lord. And whether he has a lot or if he has uh, an abundance, if he's hungry or filled or suffering, he can be content. 
And this word carries the idea of being self-sufficient or having enough or not needing outside help. The point here is Paul doesn't need aid from external temporal circumstances to help him. He, in the Lord, has everything he needs and is satisfied in God. And what's the secret to being satisfied in God alone? Without needing aid from having much or having little, it is through the strength that he has given, that he has been given outside of himself. It is through Christ who strengthens him. Have you ever been given advice or instruction from someone on how to suffer and how to trust God when you're in the midst of a trial and you just thought, oh, that's cute, but not realistic. This is the real world. This is real life. You've maybe rashly thought, this person's never experienced a hardship in their life and they're bringing this to me. Let's see them live this way at the first sign of trouble. First of all, if it's, if it's in God's word, we shouldn't be so concerned with the messenger bringing us God's word, but the message of God's word. But just to bring some perspective, Paul joyfully gave up everything this world had to offer for Christ. In chapter three, he says, whatever things were gained to me from a worldly perspective, he says, I have counted them as loss for the sake of Christ. In fact, he says, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. Paul was in jail for his faith uncertain as to if he'd be put to death. And he says, I learned to be content. I can do all things, not by my own strength, but by him who strengthens me. Our hope, our hope is never in ourself. And yet there is an unfailing hope that we have in Christ to work in us. You cannot I cannot, if left to our own devices, please the Lord. Cannot stand firm if left to ourselves. We cannot please the Lord in these unusual times, but we can do all things. We can stand firm. We can please the Lord. We can obey this text through Christ who strengthens us. What a wonderful, blessed reality for all who are in Christ. Let us live faithfully and let us stand firm in this time and not us in our strength, but in the strength that comes from Christ that we might stand firm, that we might glorify him. Let's pray. God, thank you. We thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for the richness of your word to give us such wonderful instruction for our good that we might stand firm, that we might glorify you, that we might live for you. And thank you for the strength that you provide, that we would be able to live for you, that we would be able to please you, that we would be able to glorify you. And we know that it is not us, but it is Christ in us. And so we rejoice and we praise you and we thank you and we look to you and we cling to you. And pray in Christ's name. Amen.